Uh, a tremendous privilege to introduce our keynote address uh, today, which is also the 2023 Laskin Lecture, which is co-sponsored with the York Center for Public Policy and Law, the YCCPL. The York Center for Public Policy and Law is an uh, organized research unit at York University, currently directed by Professor Richard Haig and Dan Priel, to whom we want to extend as chairs our sincere thanks. And through its activities, if you're not familiar with the YCCPL, um, YCCPL is dedicated specifically to supporting research that meets the needs of the broader community. Um, and so I thought just before introducing our distinguished guest, our wonderful speaker, I would just, um, if you'll allow me, say a word or two about the Laskin Lecture, uh, which we've co-organized with the YCCPL. The lectureship, as you know, is named after former Chief Justice for Alaskan, who was a distinguished academic in the fields of constitutional law, um, human rights, labor law, teaching for 25 years at uh, University of Toronto and for a time at Osgoode Hall Law School. And as you know, he later became uh, Chief Justice of Canada in an axial period in our constitutional history, 1973 to 1984. And I think uh, much that he, he was, much that he did, Borlaskin reflected elements that are central to this event and to this conference, bridging uh, the multiple logics of our constitutional order, spanning the best of practice and of academia, wrestling with also the realities and implications of um, being in a society not wholly in alignment with its constitutional ideals. And he experienced and reflected all of that. And it's likely for that reason that this lectureship, which was established to carry on his legacy at Osgoode Hall Law School in the public law space, has found uh, recently, but very, very happily, a home with uh, the Constitutional Cases Conference. And um, in the last many years, Laskin lecturers have included uh, Chief Justice Wagner, um, Linda Greenhouse, uh, Justice Rosie Abella, and, and others. This year's Laskin lecturer, Professor Dame Linda Colley, invites us through her scholarship to pause today and step back from our local debates, finer points of constitutional doctrine to do something that I think all of us both crave and benefit from when we have an opportunity to reflect for a time on the base nature and experience of constitutions and also how the particular, which we're here examining during the rest of our time together today, is located in a broader sweep of um, modern history. She helps us and will help us reflect on how we're participating, I think, in our Canadian constitutional lives in something of more general uh, human import. Dame Linda is the Shelby M.C. Davis 1958 Professor of History at Princeton and just truly one of the world's finest historians of British imperial and global history in the period since 1700. She's an elegant writer with an astonishing grasp of the currents of history. And you may well have read um, one of her volumes, maybe Britain, uh, Britain's Forging the Nation, which won the Wilson Prize for um, History, a remarkable uh, text, Captives, Britain, Empire and the World, or perhaps Acts of Union and Disunion, a volume that collected the 14 talks that she delivered on BBC Four in advance of the referendum on Scottish independence. The book that is immediately responsible for our invitation to her is this, um, the stunningly ambitious, very important book, which I've now had signed, um, The Gun, the Ship and the Pen, uh, Warfare Constitutions and the Making of the Modern World. This volume's starting point is recognition that since the 18th century, constitutions can be regarded as features not only of the modern state, but as um, Dame Linda uh, describes it, the state of being modern. And yet she invites us to read that history of constitutionalism since the 18th century, not just as part of a contagion of revolution or the march of democracy, as we tend to do, but actually, and instead of part of a story of global war and violence. So she takes 
us as readers through the making and spread of constitutions in stories drawn from six continents. In so doing, she deepens the claim that constitutions are tools of empire. She reminds us of the ways they've always been backed by very material violence. And she challenges us, us to think, for example, of constitutions as of a kind with other forms of literature and creative activity, much as F.R. Scott did for us in Canada in his own right. Um, and Dame Linda says, a constitution after all, as she writes, is like a novel. It invents and tells the story of a place and people. In this book, Professor Colley shows in unique and really just magisterial fashion, something that all of us in this room are eminently aware of in our day-to-day -day work. That as she puts it, constitutions are emphatically not innocent devices and never have been. A fellow of the British Academy, the Royal Society of Literature and the Academia Europea, <laughs> We are pleased to join in congratulating you um, as well, uh, Dame Linda Colley, for receiving the Order of the British Empire last year. She's delivered the uh, Trevelyan Lectures at Cambridge, the Wiles Lectures at Queens, the Belfast Ford and Bateman Lectures at Oxford, the Nehru Memorial Lecture at LSC, the Walpole Memorial Lecture at Yale, just to name a few. And we are very happy she's adding the Laskin Lecture at Osgood <laughs> to that list. So please join me in warmly welcoming uh, Professor Dean. <laughs> Thank you. Well, um, thank you very much for all those very kind words. I, I think perhaps I should just go now. <laughs> you, you've heard the best. Um, Seriously, it's, it's a great pleasure to be back in sunny Toronto. Um, and it's a very great honor uh, to be here. Um, my thanks to Professor Berger, Kid White and Lawrence for all their organization and hospitality in my visit here. Um, as you know, um, I'm a historian, uh, not unlike you, uh, you're, most of you, lawyers by training. Um, I'm not. Uh, so I hope this lecture will be a site of mutual learning, if you like. But let me start with some recent and present day events. Three years ago, in 2020, Russia's constitution was amended by some liberal activists, in part so as to proclaim that country's commitment to, I quote, the peaceful coexistence of states and peoples. The following January in 2021, the US Capitol in Washington, DC was attacked by pro-Donald Trump rioters eager to restore him to the presidency by force. Manifestly, these recent events raise questions about the efficacy of constitutional texts. They also raise questions, of course, about the relationship between constitutions and violence. As we all know, texts of this sort are not and never have been pure legal and philosophical statements. Over the centuries, they have been characterized often by deliberate untruths, by undertakings that are subsequently broken, by calculating often revealing silences, and by close attention to external as well as internal imperatives and audiences. They have also often proved short-lived and they have frequently been bound up in multiple ways with violence. And it is this subject, as we've heard, the relationship between the making, resilience and quality of codified constitutions and the threat and incidence of human violence across geographies and across centuries 
that was the subject of my recent book, The Gun, the Ship and the Pen. So today, um, on instructions, uh, I want to talk about this book while also signaling some related topics and questions that seem to me now to merit more discussion and research and acknowledgement. If we take a modern political constitution, generally, though not exclusively note, to be a written document, an endurable objective thing, in Hannah Arendt's words, then this sort of device was increasingly being resorted to both in parts of Europe and in North America from at least the mid 18th century. And there are earlier examples. By the 1810s and 20s, the use of this device was also multiplying fast in Central and Southern America. During the second half of the 19th century, an era when access to the franchise for men and just occasionally for women expanded widely, regions of Asia, North Africa and the Pacific world also began experimenting with texts that were widely treated as constitutions while also being sometimes strikingly distinctive. The First World War, which destroyed some old systems of states and monarchical empires, provoked a flurry of further, often ephemeral constitutions. So even more did the Second World War. And the contagion of constitutions still continues indeed at a faster pace than ever before. Between 1990 and 2015 alone, it has been calculated. There were at least 100 new codified constitutions. Indeed, there were more than that. <clears throat> now, approaching and understanding and explaining this broad phenomenon is often inhibited, I believe, by prevailing methodologies and teleologies. Studies of past constitutions, as you know, often adopt a national and sometimes highly patriotic focus, whereby one particular polity's paper texts and their politics and influence are examined only in isolation. Uh, and this has been particularly so uh, in the country where I work, the United States, where um, the constitution is a religion in a partic particular way. At another level, a primary concern is often to focus on just one aspect of this spread over time of written constitutions, namely the rise of democratic constitutionalism. Yet while the linkages between constitutions and different modes of democracy have clearly been vital, this is only part of the story. And again, you all know this. These instruments have been utilized, and they still are, by a wide spectrum of different governing regimes, by monarchies as well as republics, by autocracies and single party regimes, as well as by would-be liberal states, by empires, as well as by self-proclaimed nations. All this helps to explain some of the approaches that I determined to adopt in the gun, the ship and the pen, which was partly designed to reforge and reinvigorate constitutional history among historians. Now, among many legal scholars, scholars, the importance of constitutions is 
taken for granted. Um, but among historians, uh, the subject of constitutional history has receded markedly since the 1960s. Uh, it, you know, it's just disappeared in many universities among history departments. So I partly wanted to try and jog this a bit. The book, The Gun, The Ship and The Pen, takes a transnational and transcontinental approach. And it treats codified constitutions as a spreading genre and as malleable and multi-purpose pieces of political technology, not as devices that are invariably possessed of one particular set of governing and legal characteristics. I do, however, argue in this book that while the circumstances surrounding the adoption of these devices over time and in different locations have naturally varied, there are certain patterns that have repeatedly occurred. In all continents, the initial adoption, especially of a new written constitution, has frequently been an outcrop of crisis and ruptures of some sort, particularly crises and ruptures to do in some way with armed conflict. But you might say, why did warfare and the threat or actuality of war and extreme civil disturbance come to matter so much? After all, virtually every society that we know about in the long human past has been characterized by intermittent warfare and outbreaks of violence. How, when and why then? did this habitual violence begin to feed into the writing and proliferation of a certain type of political constitution? Well, first of all, it was not simply a matter of warfare per se, but of shifts in the nature and costs of warfare. By the mid 18th century, the money and personnel demands of running major hybrid <laughs> wars, by which I mean long distance conflicts evolving both large armies and substantial navies had risen to critical levels in a new way. And this put particular pressure on the state finances of two of the prime protagonists in this kind of warfare, Britain and France. The British attempt in the wake of the Seven Years' War, which ran from the mid 1750s to formerly 1763, to address these challenges by taxing its 13 American colonies ultimately led to the outbreak as we all know, of yet another, this time revolutionary and ultimately global war. This led also to the implementation of an important constitutional text here, the Quebec Act of 1774, which was designed in part to keep the local French suite in the event of an outbreak of violence in the 13 colonies. The American Revolutionary War also led to the emergence, of course, of a new initially precarious polity, the United States, which sought to order and legitimize itself by drafting and publicizing a series of new state and federal constitutions, 
just as this same conflict, the American Revolutionary War, led indirectly to the 1791 Constitutional Act here. Britain's prime rival, France, had also failed to resolve its war-related financial woes, famously resulting in a revolution on its own soil in 1789. This in turn led to a succession of protracted wars in continental Europe, and in French Saint-Domingue, the future Haiti, and these protracted conflicts gave a spur to the writing of yet more new constitutions in these regions of the world, continental Europe and Haiti. And after 1809, also in one time, Portuguese and Spanish colonies in Central and South America. Now, there's many threads in these developments, but one that continues throughout is war and the strains of much greater levels of warfare now. How do you raise the taxes? How do you raise the necessary number of men? Well, one way is by promising them more by way of texts. If you vote, you agree to carry a gun, you agree to pay taxes, uh, and you see this again and again. In underlining the centrality of these and later episodes of armed conflict for the design and proliferation of political constitutions, I am not seeking to downgrade the role of ideas ideologies and local peculiarities, not at all. Moreover, although warfare and violent ruptures have been a recurring and vital feature, there were and are different ways in which these things have fed into constitution making and rethinking. New constitutions have, for instance, often been a product of military defeat, a shock to the system that has obliged the, the polity in question to reorganize and reinvent itself. Constitutions indeed have sometimes been imposed on other places by military victors. This happened substantially in Germany and Japan after the Second World War. Uh, it had also happened earlier with Napoleon as he swept through continental Europe, would frequently defeat a place and then give it a constitution, uh, often combining liberal reforms such as toleration to Jews with, of course, the demand for more taxes, the demand for more men. This pattern of constitutional innovation following on from mil military defeat or the humiliation or collapse of a governing regime remains common now. Jennifer Widener has calculated that in the past 40 years, quote, over 200 new constitutions have emerged in countries at risk of internal violence and bouts of external violence can equally act this way. However, the current Russian Ukrainian horrors end, it is more than possible that there will be constitutional repercussions. In the event of Russian victory, an assimilationist and restrictive constitution may well be imposed on Ukraine or parts of it. Conversely, if Putin falls alongside his special operation, we may see a replacement Russian regime seeking to inaugurate and legitimate itself by means of issuing a fresh constitutional text. Constitutions, as you know, are performative and propaganda instruments 
as well as legal and political texts. And they are frequently crafted with an eye to an international audience, as well as the domestic population concerned. But what about the uses of constitutions as perceived from below? and indeed by those at risk of being subordinated in some way. Let me touch on just some of these subaltern uses, as it were, in regard to issues of imperial aggression and racial divides. And um, this is such a vast area that we may want to talk about that later. As regards the past, there was a recurring pattern of territories viewing themselves as coming under threat by expansionist powers and seeking in response to strengthen and advertise their autonomy by designing and publicizing a new political constitution. Thus, from 1840, the small Pacific islands of Hawaii generated a series of, of quite fascinating constitutions, which are well worth glancing at. These widely circulated and often quite radical Hawaiian documents were designed to affirm while also modifying these islands' distinctive cultures and political organizations, and in the process to impress foreign powers. Um, it, it was made quite explicit. Look, we, we now have a written constitution. We are modern. We deserve our place among the world's politics. This Hawaiian indige uh, indigenous leaders hoped would help deter potential American or European takeovers of the islands, a ploy which partially succeeded until the 1890s, when, of course, the Americans swept in. The Meiji Constitution in Japan in 1889, the first ever in East Asia, is in part yet another example of a polity deploying a new and very consciously well-publicized constitution, not just to reorganize itself, but also to impress foreign powers, a form of defensive modernization, as the historian Jürgen Osterhammel puts it. And of course, this happens in Canada too. Uh, with uh, what has come to be called the 1867 Constitutional Act. Now, there's many reasons behind this, as you know much better than I, but one of, it, one of the reasons, again, is a kind of defensive modernization. After the ending of the American Civil War, there were powerful voices in Washington, D.C., saying, hey, we're owed. Um, we remain a united, powerful polity, let's move north. Um, and 1867 was in part an attempt, obviously a successful attempt, uh, to shut those kind of voices down. Particularly threatened and vulnerable groupings within politics have also sometimes been able to profit from helping to initiate or influence a new constitutional order and text. Thus, the duration and ferocity of the wars of independence in South America after 1809 and the many wars that continued between the new republics in this region frequently led to concessions being made on paper to one-time black slaves local Indian groupings and poor whites. And, and again, you know, it's, it's fairly straightforward. These new South American republics, they're often at war, they need to raise armies, 
and they look at these different disadvantaged groupings to the men in them, of course, and say, hey, do you want to come into the polity? Then fight for us. So by 1850, levels of democracy, male democracy, in much of South America are far more impressive than they are in the United States or indeed in much of Europe. The many linkages between conflict and constitution and making prompt, of course, further questions. Most constitutions drafted in the past, like most constitutional revisions now, have been overwhelmingly the work of elites and specialists of different kinds, politicians, rulers, military leaders, lawyers, bureaucrats and the like. So what is it that allows elite driven constitutional texts of this sort, sometimes subsequently, to be widely accepted as social and political contracts, emblems for an entire polity and its population. The challenges involved in achieving this, converting an elite driven text into a noted feature of a political system that is capable of attracting wide loyalty and acceptance, become even greater when a constitution has to be put together very quickly, which since constitutions have so often been products of crisis is frequently the case. All constitution makers, but especially those having to work at speed have been to a degree borrowers, you know this. Thus the Norwegian constitution of 1814, the second longest surviving on the globe had to be drafted in just five weeks because an invaded Swedish army was known to be on the way. As a result, the Norwegian delegates responsible for this constitution borrowed furiously, incorporating their own ideas to be sure, but also lifting in some cases entire paragraphs from the published constitutions of other countries, France, the USA, Holland, Poland, Spain, and from books on Britain's constitutional order and common law. So it's like a patchwork quilt. But when, even when constitution makers have been able to take more time over their task, the need to put in place a new political settlement promptly, as well as other factors, normally leads to a degree of calculated plagiarism. Canada's Charter of Rights and Freedoms, as you know, has become widely influential and borrowed from elsewhere. So has South Africa's first post-apartheid constitution of 1996, whose makers in turn borrowed from elsewhere. Not least the South African architects of this constitution borrowed from the current German constitution, the basic law, which in turn was itself crafted in part by American and British jurists after the Second World War. Uh, the first and most widely known article of Germany's basic law is that human dignity shall be inviolable. When I was in Germany last year, I was told that this is not just the best known, this is the only known part of the constitution <laughs> as far as many Germans are concerned. But you can see why that statement, human dignity shall be inviolable, uh, why it had so much appeal uh, in post-apartheid South Africa and was replicated there. The fact that 
codified constitutions are so often hybrids, studied mixes of local and foreign ideas and words, makes even sharper the question of why and how far these hybrid creations are sometimes able to become icons for allegiance in a particular territory. The need to address such questions further underlines for people in my discipline why a broadening out and rethinking of constitutional history is so important. Exploring a constitution only in its national context is likely to miss out on the ways in which its making and content may very well have been influenced by writings, ideas and actions elsewhere. Precisely because they are written texts, successful and striking constitutions especially have regularly been widely reprinted in multiple languages in multiple locations. Um, this was manifestly true of the American federal constitution, but it was also true of the Meiji constitution of 1889, uh, which passed not only into many European languages, but also into some Chinese, Ottoman and Indian languages and print sources also. The Indian constitution too has been widely publicized in multiple languages. It was, I suspect, gesturing to my own place of origin, the UK, a recognition that the wide print coverage and translation potential afforded by written constitution was allowing its competitors to parade and celebrate their political systems internationally that in part led from the early 19th century onwards to a sharp rise in the number of published works devoted to British constitutional history. And indeed that that phrase constitutional history only becomes common in Britain from the 1820s. And I think it's clear why it's not just that um, Britain has an empire then in which common law traditions have spread. Uh, and so there's a, an overseas market for these kind of texts, but there's also a political motive, I think. From the 1690s, the British had controlled a rising array of print networks, but of course they can't exploit these in order to publicize and puff their own codified constitution because they don't have one. They still don't have one. Hence, in part, surely, the busy cult in the Victorian era and early 20th century of celebratory books devoted to a version of Britain's constitutional history and classic legal texts, Blackstone, Dicey, on and on and on. To a degree, the British needed to create an equivalent of and a riposte to the ever expanding number of printed accounts of other countries' constitutions and governing systems. And evolving a cult of constitutional history was one of the ways I think that the British sought to do that. Along with the recurrent stimuli of warfare and violence, a more rapid expansion of print outlets, the exponential rise in some regions of the world of cheap and rapidly produced print and an acceleration in literacy rates. Clearly that all played a role 
in the rise and spread of written constitutions. That this was so underlines again why new variants of constitutional history will need to be cast broadly, as well as tackling law and politics. They will also, I believe, have to intermesh more with cultural history, with the history of language, with the history of the book and consumerism, et cetera, et cetera. They will also, and I entirely agree with Ben here, have to intermesh more as well with religious history and religion generally. As Top B remarked, connections between constitutionalism and religion have frequently been intimate. And I think that there's a huge area that um, really needs a lot more exploration in this regard. What I think is abundantly clear already, and this is my last substantive point, is that a resort to cultural forms has often played a role in making an elite driven constitution full of borrowings from elsewhere appear nonetheless a natural <laughs> and indigenous growth. Visual imagery has sometimes contributed to this as well as words and print and indeed rituals. The current and now threatened Indian constitution formally issued in 1950 would be a case in point. In line with the determination of its makers, conspicuously Ambedkar, that this was to be an educative and teaching text, each of the Indian constitution's 22 parts was originally planned as coming complete with visual illustrations. The thinking behind these images, which drew on Indian folklore, religion and myths, went far beyond decoration. The official intention, which was made explicit, was to celebrate with these drawings, India's, I quote, 5,000 year old history, a calculated phrase and claim, of which this new constitution would its makers hoped be viewed as a natural and integral part. Just one more splendid example, one more splendid episode in a long distinctive but now democratic history. Here was very much an example of invented tradition at work, a new and very much hybrid political constitution being deliberately presented and devised so as to serve as a national Indian icon despite all its many foreign borrowings. In fact, uh, about 60% of this 1950 Indian constitution was taken from British legislation. Uh, but that is not, of course, how it was presented. Um, and the representation was for a long time very successful. All this prompts a final thought, uh, and I see that you're touching on this in your debates this afternoon. Growing numbers of us now inhabit societies where the majority of the population gets the bulk of its political information from a screen, not from the printed page. Moreover, the coming of a digital age 
is relentlessly bringing about a balkanization of data and debate in regards to law, politics, and allegiance as much else. We are increasingly leaving behind that narrow aperture world where individuals relied heavily for their political orientation on books or just a few TV and radio channels or a few major newspapers and magazines. Instead, in many parts of the world, there is now a cacophony of potential political information, influences and nostrums transmitted by way of multiple media and multiple voices. The implication of all this for the status, operation and futures of political constitutions and constitutional law will require, I suspect, ever more analysis and attention, and also, I hope, better understanding of the past, hence in part my book. Thank you very much. Well, we have just a few minutes um, for an opportunity for any questions. And as, as you consider that, I think just a, a tremendous thank you for an opportunity. What a joy to step back um, and to think about the um, project and history of which um, everything else we're discussing uh, is a part and to do so in um, such an expansive embracing way. So we do have just a few minutes uh, if anyone has a uh, question they'd like to put or uh, a comment um, that they'd like to follow through on. I see David itching to be the, the why don't we do that, David? Can we start with David? And do we have a, we do. Yeah. But why don't, why don't you go ahead and the microphone will sure. come. Thank you very much. David Schneider, University of Toronto. Hi. Hi. Uh, enjoyed your book immensely. Um, I'm wondering if you uh, can point to some examples where the constitutional borrowing has gone wrong. The um, constitutional borrowing has gone wrong. Constitutional borrowing has gone wrong. So it's been a misreading. So I'm prompted to think about this because of Montesquieu's understanding of the mixed constitution in Britain, and describing it as a separated powers as between the political branches would seem to be just a misreading. And, and of course, we end up with January 6th, this sort of end point in that narrative. But I'm wondering if you have, in, in the work that you've done, you've come across some of these uh, borrowings that just aren't quite, you know, ha have gone off the rails or have misread other experiences um, uh, and, and probably gave short life, shelf life to those constitutional orders. That's a really interesting question. Um, which of course is, is short way of saying I'm not absolutely sure of the answer. Um, I, I mean, it's been shown that the average shelf life of a constitution is about 16, 17 years uh, overall, uh, which is pretty much what Jefferson said should be the longevity of a constitution. Uh, and many of them last uh, much less than that. Um, I think they do take that legislators often get things, of course, utterly wrong and utterly wrong uh, in so many ways. I mean, it's so funny when you, you read the disputes uh, in Philadelphia um, in the many months they debate what becomes the 1787 draft federal constitution of the United States. Um, how often they just make the wrong conclusions from the past. So um, I came across a wonderful speech uh, about how awful it was in Britain that money had led to so much corruption. Um, and they then proceeded to say, um, well, we don't 
in America need to worry about money because we don't have that kind of corruption. What we've got to do is worry about rank. Uh, so, you know, they, they, they select the wrong things which suit their own prejudices. So uh, the American constitution is very strong on no American is to accept a title but of course, the corruption of money is left unlegislated against, uh, unlegislated against in uh, the 1787 draft and, and what eventually gets accepted in 1789. And it's because they see the British system from which they emerge, but they see it wrong and they draw the wrong conclusions in part. Uh, so uh, your uh, your talk had me thinking about the uh, the dialogue between uh, courts, uh, particularly apex courts like here at the Supreme Court of Canada and the legislature in constitutional interpretation. Um, and I I started uh, querying whether it should fall on the courts to perhaps bring life to these uh, constitutions and perhaps animate them with these local values, um, even if the vocabulary was borrowed. Um, I see that in the, in the, in the Canadian uh, context in the way, you know, we've interpreted, say, for example, Section 8 of our charter, uh, which I guess the equivalent in the United States would be the Fourth Amendment. Um, and some of the values that we think are somewhat indigenous to the Canadian experience um, and you know, see how that conflicts with how uh, the Fourth Amendment has been interpreted by the courts in the American context. Is that a way for us to get around this idea of you know, borrowing and borrowing gone wrong? Is should we you know, punt it to the courts to perhaps inject you know, these constitutions with the actual values of that particular, uh, you know, that particular location to, uh, to, as I said, animate it with those, uh, you know, the kind of values of that particular culture. Should it be the court's job, I, I guess is the, is the question that I'm asking. Or if the, the language is borrowed and it doesn't work, we should just chuck it out and start new or can it be left up to yeah. the courts to do that work yeah. um that is in part a, a set of legal questions which um, i'm not really competent to answer what i would say is that the more amenable to responsible amendment a constitution is usually the better uh one of the reasons why Norway's constitution has apparently lasted so long is that it's not in fact the same constitution. I mean, it's just amended and amended and amended. Whereas one obvious reason why the United States constitution is in such a mess is that amendment is incredibly difficult. And I have to say the US Supreme Court is not making it any easier. So it depends on the Supreme Court. Uh, and in a sense, I think what, but again, taking the American case, what you do get, you do get more nuance, more, if you like, nativist inserts with the state constitutions in the 19th century. And indeed, up to about 1850, when Americans referred to their constitution, they were more often than not referring to their state constitution. That doesn't mean that the state constitution was particularly liberal mind. It was the state constitutions that did most of the stealing of land from indigenous people by uh, changing boundaries and so forth and, and rulings. But it, it did create very often these this succession of state constitutions, documents that at least the local whites could see as something that was more peculiarly theirs. Mm 
Well, I'm, I'm afraid we're going to have to um, kind of truncate the conversation, at least together. We'll have a 10 minute break now before we assemble again. But I, I do have to just observe a couple of things, um, Tim Linda, as we close. First of all, um, the learned historical lessons that the more amenable to responsible amendment to constitution, the better sends chills up um, Canadian <laughs> constitutionalist uh, Sorry. spine. Sorry. Uh, but but it's probably a very important lesson for us to internalize. But I, I am left thinking about the conversations that we are having in many places are having about um, approaches of interpretation of constitutional text and how important the lessons you're telling, um, including borrowing and and uh, the international global character are to the way we think about how to actually interpret a constitution, which is something very much on Canadian constitutionalist minds right now. Um, and also the lessons um, that you offer from the link between war, um, vulnerability, violence, and constitutions to think about pulling practices of treaty making into the fold of what constitutions are, which of course is a very deep story here and so just um a couple of thoughts of things that i'm going to be left with after that wonderful address and i on behalf of everyone here i just want to thank you again so um genuinely for coming and for sharing with us